over this Advent season, I will work through four different carols. Um, the carol, as I said, we're talking about today is O Holy Night. For many, many people, this is a favorite. I, I don't know about you. I posted one earlier today on the church uh, Facebook page, um, an a cappella version. It's, I think, five guys standing, I think, in what is an entryway of somebody's home, but it's one of those tall ceiling kind of rotunda, ent- rotunda kind of entryways. And, and as these guys sing, it just gives me goosebumps. So if you haven't heard it this morning already, when you get home, check that out. But uh, uh, we're going to be digging into these, and I'm going to give you some background. We're going to pull some things out of them and hopefully be able through this to make much of Jesus and to celebrate this season rightly. So let me start off by giving you some of the, the context about the history of this song that we're going to be talking about. The song, O Holy Night, was written back in the mid-1800s. And what's interesting about this song is that uh, there was a parish priest who was looking to have uh, a new Christmas song, and he lived in a town where there was this really talented, uh, really gifted poet, uh, a French merchant poet. His name was Placido Capito. And the priest went to him and said, you know, this might sound a little weird. I know you're not even a Christian, but you're pretty talented. Would you be willing to, to take Luke chapter 2 out of the Bible and, and write a, a poem that we could use and sing as a Christmas carol? Well, yeah, sure, I, guys are always looking for work. Poets don't tend to turn opportunities like that down. It was a paying job, so sure thing. The thing you need to know about this poet, though, he was known around town as kind of the, the town wild man, Right? He, he liked to carouse, he liked to party, he liked to have a good time. So not your typical guy you would normally think of writing a Christmas hymn, particularly because, like I said, he wasn't a Christian. Well, he writes this song. Well, then, of course, they need some music. And so they go to a, a musician, and they say, could you set this to music? Well, interestingly enough, the musician they sought was also not a Christian. So they use a non-Christian with the book of Luke and another non-Christian to write this music, and they write, as you heard, this song, Oh Holy Night, it, it, a beautiful, amazing, wonderful, it gives me goosebumps song, right? Now this was all good and great, the church started singing it. It started to spread. Other churches, this priest passed it out to other parishes. Other, other priests were singing it. It was spreading throughout the region. People were loving the song. And then all of a sudden, word got out about who it was that had written this song. And some of the church people were scandalized. <laughs> you can't have a drunk writing our Christmas songs preached. Come on. So some people started to complain. Some people started to get worried. What will people think? Well, as you know, we're still singing it today, so you can figure out which side of that argument won out. Right? Some people wanted it removed, but obviously that did not happen. And then, just like today, many, many, many people. It's an all-time favorite Christmas carol. Another interesting fact about this particular song Uh, you may or may not know about this, is about five decades later in 1906, this song was one of the very first things that was ever broadcast via radio. Uh, A man by the name of Reginald Fessenden, I think is how you say his name, he was a Canadian professor, and he is the guy who invented AM radio, the amplitude modulation that you can broadcast with. And he's acclaimed to be the inventor of this. And so he he put this widget together to transmit radio signal into the world. And and it's told that the first thing he did is he read Luke chapter 2, verse 1, into the microphone that he was going to be broadcasting from. And he said, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And then he read the rest of the Christmas story. And when he was done with that, he took out his violin and he began to play. And this was among the songs he played. Oh, holy night. And I'm sure it was incredibly beautiful. But you know the odd part about it was? The radio receiver hadn't been invented yet, so nobody heard it. He was broadcasting into nothing. 
But he was the first, supposedly. But nobody could hear him play. But think about this for a moment. You can only imagine what it would have been like to be there on that first holy night. I mean, to us today, I, I think... We think of the manger scene as something quite powerful. Uh, we, we decorate our homes uh, with various nativity sets. My wife put one in the youth room last week when she was teaching, so the one that normally would live in my office, Kevin has on a windowsill downstairs. So we have that, and I think Jan is going to be bringing some in for the, the luncheon, and, and we're going to have some of those, I think, around church as well. And we've got some in the, in the library, if you haven't seen those, and you probably have a nativity too at home. My wife has a huge... Like, it, it's the size of the speaker, uh, a manger scene with these giant figurines that I'm afraid to touch because I might break that we put out each year. And so, you know, that scene is powerful. It draws emotion out of us, right? Because you've got the little baby Jesus. And then you've got the, the Virgin Mary. And you've got, you've got Joseph and the, and the cows who were lowing, as the story tells us. What is lowing? Does anybody know? I, I don't know what lowing is. I've been around cows a little bit, but not enough apparently to have them low at me. But the cows were lowing. And as we look at that, there's, there's some real emotion to it, right? And it's, it's, it's simple. It's humble. It's not how you would expect a king to enter into the world. And think of the story leading up to that time, right? I mean, here you have a a teenage girl pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which is like a whole nother story we could talk about. We're not getting into today, but, but, and, 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 and she, along with her probably teenage fiance, they're traveling on the back of a donkey. I mean, picture this in your mind. She's nine months pregnant, riding on a donkey. 80 plus miles to go and be counted in some stupid government census, right? How many of us would have griped about that? Now, when my wife was about to give birth, I really showed her classy. I took her to the hospital in a Honda Civic. I got one up on Joseph, right? Right? And I remember driving that Honda Civic thinking, oh my, oh my, because it was 15 miles to the hospital. And we weren't in any rush, I don't think, but it was just like, now the stakes are higher. It didn't become real till this little guy was about to enter the world. Then all of a sudden it's like every bump in the road was dangerous, right? And especially that first drive home. But can you imagine riding in the back of a donkey? And they come into town. There's no place to stay. If you haven't seen it in the movie theaters, a movie called The Star, go see it. It's fun. It's wonderful. Cute story about the animals telling of the events leading into the birth of Christ. A great way to go out. If you've got grandkids, take them with you. Have some fun. But they get to, to this town, and it's a small town, and there's nowhere for them to stay. The Hilton is full, Right? They can't get the jacuzzi suite they'd reserved. So they wander around, knocking on doors. You got room? No. You got room? No. We'll take your your back corner. No, we got somebody there already. Oh. And so this young couple, child about to arrive, end up in what most scholars would tell you it was probably more like a cave than the wooden manger scene my wife puts out at Christmas. A little enclave, a little hollowed out space where animals would go during a storm for shelter and protection. They'd get out of the the rough weather and be protected from predators there. And here we have the birth of Jesus, Mary, the mother of Jesus, giving birth in the worst environment possible, right? Right? I mean, we're talking unsterile, no epidural. I mean, can you imagine that, ladies? You got a young mother probably screaming her brains out. 
I mean, I remember the pain my wife was going through while she was having contractions. It was, oh, man, we had all day. We got to the hospital at 5 in the morning. Our son wasn't born until 7 at night. It was a long day. And I remember the pain she went through. Just agonizing. Probably the longest day of our lives. And we were in a hospital with many doctors, with nurses and equipment and all kinds of things that they could do to make you comfortable. Little ice chips she could have and all that kind of stuff, right? We had a good. And think of Mary and Joseph. Think of the screaming. Think of the yelling. Think of the chaos. And that was just Joseph. (laughs) Right? Well, it had to be pretty amazing to be there. I'm sure that night was absolutely crazy as Mary was giving birth to the Son of God. Now in this song, O Holy Night... There's a phrase that I want to dig into and look at, and we're going to focus in. And we're going to do that as we work through these carols. We're going to pull some little snippets out and focus in on them. And hopefully it'll add a a deeper layer to these songs as well as to your your Christmas celebration as you celebrate the birth of Christ. And the first one, and and you may have seen this pulled out before, but we're going to look at it, I think, in an interesting way. The phrase I want to look at is where the song says, it says, a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. The weary world, right? Can you say that? On the count of three. One, two, three. Weary world. Weary world. Then it says, For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. It's hard for me not to start singing when I read these words. Fall on your knees. But if there's a, an accurate way to describe our world today, I think I'd say it's weary world, right? I mean, the world is overwhelming at the moment. There's so much anxiety. There's so much going on in politics. There's, there's so many broken relationships that are messed up. There's so much serious disease in the world and nations fighting and families struggling. Like we're almost just... I feel like we're just fighting to keep our heads above water, right? And so I think so many people can relate to this phrase, the weary world. But what I love about this song is it also says the thrill of hope as well. I mean, imagine the chaos of that first holy night. Of course, there's this thrill of hope because maybe, maybe, just maybe, the Messiah was going to be born. You see, the Jews had been looking for that for thousands of years. It was the thing they couldn't wait to have happen. And when the Messiah was born, on that day, everything would be different forever and ever. And you can hear that kind of faith when you hear the, the thrill of hope. And if you know the lyrics, then suddenly the weary world does what? It says, the weary world rejoices. Right? And I pray to God that if there's any weary world in your heart today, that you will indeed in this season experience the thrill of hope inside of your weary world. That inside of that, you will find the faith to rejoice. Because even in the the chaos of that night, there comes a new and glorious morn. And every time as you and I move forward in life, I want you to not just think about the dark night and the pain and the struggles and the trials. But think about what happens the next day when the sun comes up. The Savior has been born and a new and glorious morn. And in that moment, everything is different because a day with Christ can change everything. 
I truly believe that. A day with Christ can change everything. Let's focus in on that, a new and glorious morning part. What I want to do is take you back to the Old Testament. We're going to be in the book of Lamentations. There's Bibles in the seats in front of you. You're welcome to open up an iPad or iPhone or if you brought your own Bible. Um, The book of Lamentations 3 is where we're going to be at in the Old Testament, uh, verses 20 through 26. And you should be able to see it up on the screen as I get to it here as well. But uh, you're always welcome to open up a Bible. It's good to have a good Bible and to use it and to wear it out and to have to buy a new one. Not a bad problem to have in life. But Lamentations 3... 20 through 26. And if you don't know the background of this book, Lamentations, to lament, right? This comes in the year uh, year 586 BC, before Christ. So almost 600 years before the birth of Christ. Jerusalem had fallen. And the people were distraught. This is the city that God, this is the land, this is the people that God had given the land to and they had built this city and now they lost it. They'd been conquered. They're in trouble. And so they were distraught. They were distraught, as you might imagine. And the prophet Jeremiah lived during this time and he is the one who writes this. He is the one doing the lamenting. He's the one whining. The book of Lamentations is Jeremiah whining. He was known as a crying prophet. And he's hurting. And he's just pouring his heart out in this book. And in chapter 3, when we get to that, as we read through this book, there's kind of a switch at this point where, where he moves from just griping and complaining and lamenting and crying his heart out to here he finds just this little ray of hope, a little moment of faith. And I love this. He says in Lamentations 3, 20 through 26, he says, my soul continually remembers it and it bowed down within me. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great, Lord, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait in him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So in other words, in verse 20, he's saying, Despite what's happened, we've been conquered. I will remember. He says, he says, I know life isn't going the way I want it to go right now. This is not the way it should be. Now, some of us, when that happens, our reaction is, my son does this occasionally when he's in trouble. He'll put his hands over his ears like he can't hear me, right? And he'll close his eyes. If, 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 if I turn away from you and I close my eyes and I put my hands over my ears, you're not yelling at me anymore. Like that goes away, right? And somehow he hears everything I say. That, that's one way to react. But Jeremiah says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put my hands over my ears and close my eyes and pretend this didn't just happen. Bad things did happen. But he is acknowledging that even within the bad things, we can keep the faith. Even when we have significant life-altering problems, difficulties, they had just lost the promised land. That's a big deal if you're a Jew. But despite that, he says, no, my hope is going to carry on. In verse 21, he says, But I I call to mind, and therefore, I have hope. I love that he says this. He says, I'm going to call this back to mind, right? He realizes that he needs to be intentional in this season when things aren't going like he wants them to go. He needs to be intentional about what he is going to be thinking about. Because it would be easy just to think about something else, right? It would be easy just to get caught up in the misery, 
to grumble just like everybody else because he didn't have things go the way he wanted them to go. But instead, instead, he says, no, I will choose to have hope. When others are choosing not to have hope, I am going to choose hope because I know the one that I hope in. God has not abandoned me. So he says, I call this to mind. Therefore, I have hope. And then he says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy, or his mercies, plural, never come to an end. It's powerful. I don't know if you've read through the book of Lamentations before, seen this or not. But he says about God's compassion that they are new every morning. That God doesn't abandon us. God doesn't forget us. When things aren't going like we want them to go, it's not because God has said, oh, I forgot about that guy. Right? And then at this point in Scripture, Jeremiah just starts talking to God. I mean, at first he was talking about God earlier. Now he's talking to God. And he just says to God, God, great is your faithfulness. And then he says, I remind myself, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who, who, whose hope is in him, Jeremiah says, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You see, it is amazing what a new day with Jesus can bring. And I want to show you a couple of truths out of this that can bring you the thrill of hope in this season when maybe your world does occasionally feel a little weary, when when it seems like darkness might be winning the battle, when it seems like it's blow after blow. I don't know if I can withstand all of this. I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if you've ever reached that point. Or you've just been, oh, the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you're weary from it. If you're taking notes, the first note is this. Every new day with Christ brings exactly what you need. Now, I didn't say what you want. Because what you need and what you want can be two very different things. Verse 24 says this, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is my portion. What does this mean, right? Well, it could mean any of a a number of different things. I mean, some believe, and, and I'm inclined to believe with them, that this is referring back to the time in which the Israelites were wandering around in the desert. And every single day, they would wake up from their slumber, stick their heads out of the tent to see if God had brought food that day. Manna! Right? And every day, God was faithful. Well, six days out of seven. On the sixth, you could collect some extra for the Sabbath. And every day, for 40 years, they had to wake up hoping, hopefully believing that God had shown up again, performed his miracle, and provided them food. God was trying to teach them something. He was trying to teach them that they need to rely upon him each and every single day for what they need. Just like in the New Testament, when Jesus taught us to pray, right? Give us this day, what? Our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Because I think that's what God wants for us every single day. He wants us to wake up every morning in the anticipation that He is going to provide for our needs. And the good news is, and I want you to know this, that while you're still relying on him today for today's needs, he's already started working on tomorrow. 
He has a plan. God's not just up there in heaven trying to figure it out as he goes. He already knows how the story is going to end. So put your hope and trust in him. He has everything you need. And whatever today or tomorrow might bring, he is there with you. He is absolutely there with you. Whatever you're going through. We need to put our hope and trust in him. If your marriage is struggling, what I want you to understand is God is working. Wake up tomorrow with the anticipation he's working in it. If you are weak today, know that God is already in your tomorrow and his strength will be working and working perfectly in your weakness. If you're down, if you're depressed, if you're lonely, see, Jesus is already in your tomorrow. He will not abandon you. He is the lifter of your head. A new day with Christ always brings exactly what you need. And what you need is the presence of God. His reality, His strength, His power, His goodness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, says Jeremiah. Therefore, I will wait for him. A new day with Christ brings exactly what we need. The second thing you'll see there in your notes, I hope this ministers to you, is that a new day in Christ brings us the hope to keep on going. It's the thrill of hope in a weary world. It's the thrill of hope in our faith when life is filled with so much darkness. It's the belief that a new morning is coming in the middle of the chaotic night. Verse 25 says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. Someone said this, and I think this is interesting. Humans can live roughly 40 days without food in extreme circumstances. Give or take, and under under optimal conditions, you can go up to eight days without water. Most of us would only make about four, but some people make it as far as eight days. We can live as much as four minutes with no oxygen. But it's nearly impossible to live for just a few seconds with no hope. And I believe there are are too many people today who are trying to survive with very little to no hope in their lives. They're hope deprived. They're struggling to find places to put their hope. And in fact, oftentimes, they're putting their hope in the wrong things. The stock market That's a terrible place to put your hope. Your children, horrible place to put your hope. They're going to disappoint you. I love my son, but man, he's going to disappoint me. Your company, don't put your hope there. Right? Your wife, your husband, not a good investment of hope. Sorry. Put your hope in something greater. If you put your hope in the things of this world where moths and rust may destroy, that's exactly what's going to happen. It's going to fail and you're going to feel broken and it's going to steal your your hope and your joy. We so often put our hope in the wrong things and in the wrong places. And when we put our hope in the wrong places, we start to and end up becoming hopeless. And then the weary world begins to win in our hearts. And we wonder, where is the good in this world? Because our hope has been put in the wrong places. I love what Hebrews 10.23 says. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I love that picture. 
Let us hold on to it. Hold on to it if you're struggling. Hold on to it and don't let go. If you're a Christian, grab a hold of that promise. Don't ever let go. He who promised is faithful. Don't ever let go because Jesus is faithful to fulfill his promises to us. The challenge today is that I believe there are just so many people in our world who are letting go of the hope that we as Christians profess. And when you let go of hope, then you grab on to fear. You grab on to anxiety. You see the darkness rather than the light. I don't know if you've ever done a cave tour. I've done a number of them. And on one particular cave tour, they led us into this area of the cave. You know, you're underground, it's completely dark. And, and all they have in this particular area are little lights on the floor because they're going to do something, right? They want to get you there, but they don't want to let you see it before you get there. So you get into this space and you can kind of hear from the echoes. It's a cavern of some sort. It's big. And then they shut off the floor lights. They warn you. They shut off the floor lights. You've never seen dark if you've never been underground before and had all the lights shut off. It's a whole level of dark that you can't comprehend. It's, I mean, you better be holding on to something. It's disorientating. And then the guy on this tour took out a single candle and lit a single flame. And the amount of light that tiny little tapered candle put off was unbelievable. All of a sudden, you could see sparkles, beauty. And after that takes your breath away for a moment, they flip the switch, the lights come on, and it's just the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Sometimes hope is like that. We can't focus on that darkness. Sometimes it's just that little light. But the radiant beauty is coming. Hold on. Hold on to that day. Let go of fear. Let go of anxiety. Let go of the stress. Let go of the panic. Let go of the doubt. And hold on to the hope that we profess. Hang on to the promises of God. And don't let go. Don't ever lose hope. Because a new day is coming. A new day filled with hope. Hold on to that and let God lead your life. And find yourself living more deeply each and every day in the love and blessing God has intended for you. Let's pray.